The state budget that was signed in June included $24 million over two years to fund what its backers say are independent academic units at five public universities. The Salmon P. Chase Center for Civics, Culture and Society at Ohio State is named for Ohio's 23rd governor, who was also a U.S. Senator and Treasury Secretary under President Abraham Lincoln. It was part of Senate Bill 117, along with the Institute of American Constitutional Thought and Leadership, which will be at the University of Toledo, College of Law. When the budget passed, three more centers were added at Cleveland State, the University of Cincinnati, and Miami University. While the centers are described as independent, the sponsor of the bill to create them, Republican Senator Jerry Serino, said in a statement after the budget passed that there is nothing like these centers at this scale in any other state. And that, quote, leftist ideology has a monopoly on most college campuses that is squashing intellectual diversity and punishing wrong think and anti-woke dogma. But I do not believe the way to cure the leftist bias on campus is by foisting conservative ideology on academia. I believe the real fix is to ensure neutrality on the part of the instructors and administrators. Let all sides be heard. Let students decide for themselves what is true. Let free speech be preserved and protected. That is the American way. It should be taught in our universities again. Serino is also the sponsor of Senate Bill 83. That bill would make big changes in public colleges and universities, such as banning most mandatory diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI training, and prohibiting faculty strikes and ideological litmus tests in hiring and admissions. It would also require faculty to allow intellectual diversity to be expressed on specific controversial issues identified as climate policies, electoral policies, foreign policy, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, immigration policy, marriage, or abortion. There are other examples uh, around the country, like the Hoover Institute uh, and uh, in California, where, where, where schools have been uh, sort of carved out, if you will, uh, for particular purposes. And the purpose here is, as you know from our past discussions on Senate Bill 83, uh, you know, there's a lot of concern in the legislature, certainly a lot of concern from, from myself uh, relative to uh, the, uh, the uh, ability for students uh, of all values and of all perspectives to express themselves. We know that uh, from recent studies that have been done uh, on schools in Ohio, Ohio State particularly, that the self-censorship among conservative students is extremely high. Uh, and those are the ones who admit it and report it. Um, so the purpose of these institutes is, is it's not political, it is not one side of the spectrum or the other. It really is to make sure that we can carve out an indie, with a, a pretty good level of independence um, to, to have these schools set up within the schools, within the universities, of course, um, and, and to make sure that, that the students and the faculty are able to look at things from a neutral standpoint uh, in line with the Chicago principles that I believe you're familiar with, uh, the Chicago principles uh, really suggest that students to get a proper education need to understand different points of view, need to have participation in rigorous debate and discussion, and that there's no subjects that are really off limits from an opinion standpoint, uh, and that the faculty needs to uh, develop an environment in the classroom where students feel free to do those things, to take positions. Uh, and it's actually, I think, uh, I think significantly raising the bar for free speech uh, in, in our universities. And so we felt that, look, uh, one of the quickest ways to try to move the dial a little bit in our universities, uh, which we know lean, from, from, lean to the left, of, of course, uh, is to not so much try to go to the right as it is to neutralize things. Uh, and these institutes, we believe, are, are the best way to get there in a very short period of time. When you talk about neutrality, who makes the call on neutrality? How can you guarantee that there will be neutrality in these centers? Well, uh, let's, let's give you an example, uh, Karen. If, if you know, you're teaching economics within one of these institutes, okay, um, there needs to be a, a very careful study of, let's say, the capitalist form of economic theory uh, versus uh, socialism or some other economic theory. There's probably more than just those two, but those are the two principally uh, that generally compete for each other with, with each other. And, and I think a professor should make sure that there is a rigorous discussion and research in, uh, about 
each of those respective uh, economic uh, models, uh, evaluating historically which ones have done better than the other, has one in fact done better than the other, which one is the best for uh, promoting uh, an environment of freedom uh, within within an, uh, a country. Uh, and, and so, again, I think it, it's not so much um, guiding students to take a particular point of view, because that would be indoctrination and that would that would be teaching them what to think. As you know, from my Senate Bill 83, my goal is to help students teach, learn how to think, not so much what to think. Were the universities where these centers will be located consulted? Did they want these institutions? Well, we had, uh, I think, rather significant discussions with the University of Toledo. Uh, and as you know, that institute is within the law school there. Uh, it's not for the entire university, although other students can in the undergraduate world can uh, very likely access courses if they wish. Uh, or the university can recognize courses within the institute for credit in a, a regular baccalaureate program. But um, that was to solve a particular problem that had been pointed out to us through numerous inputs, uh, people that felt that they uh, were had gone through the law school and, and felt that things were very much leaning in one direction. Um, we did not consult with the other universities, although I will tell you, as a part of my uh, development of Senate Bill 83 that was introduced in March. I have spent an enormous amount of time talking with and meeting with the presidents of every university, every state university, and all of the community colleges as well, uh, to, uh, to get their input on things in general that certainly relate to some of the concerns we had, which led to the institutes. We decided uh, in the budget, uh, you know, just two days before we passed the budget, uh, that we were going to expand uh, from two, which was the original bill, Senate Bill 117, to five, uh, and we just we we didn't have a lot of time to make consultations. Uh, we uh, we used our best judgment uh, to uh, to select the schools, uh, and I actually had a couple of schools uh, presidents call me afterwards and uh, tell me that they wish they had been on the list. Um, so I think that's good feedback. When you talk about the feedback that you get from people who've come out of these colleges and universities who say that they feel like they uh, were self, they're being censored, that their opinions aren't being valued. Is there any data to back that up? I mean, that's anecdotal in a sense. So do you have any proof, essentially, that this is happening in a big way? Yeah, there's definitely proof. And I'll be happy to send you some of the studies. There was one done recently by uh, ACTA, which you may be familiar, familiar with. Uh, and they did it uh, uh, for the last couple of years and very recently did it for last year at Ohio State University. And uh, I'm going off the top of my head because I don't have the study handy, but I will tell you the self-censorship rate amongst those declaring themselves as um, is um, either moderate or you know, clear conservatives, I believe that was in the 70 percentile, 70 percent range. And, and the, the previous study to that was very similar to that. And there have been other studies outside of Ohio done. Uh, so it's really not anecdotal. Uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is based on studies uh, that have been done. Uh, I mean, Harvard did one recently as well. Uh, and I'll be happy to send you the information on that one. But th it's clear that there have been some very credible independent studies that suggest that students of the conservative side of things uh, feel like they cannot or should not express themselves for fear of retribution, poor grades, uh, bad marks on papers, you know, et cetera. And I think we would all agree that that should not be the case. I wanna to talk to you about some of the budget language, which could be seen as vague. For instance, the center directors will be hired by an academic council that will come from a nationwide search of quote, scholars with relevant ex expertise and experience. And the goal is that no fewer uh, than three council members will be from Ohio. Could this potentially open the door, though, to all of those being political partisan appointees with, and people from out of state having uh, an influence on Ohio's institutions? Well, I can tell you, we've already started to get lots of resumes. Uh, I, I have not solicited resumes because I'm not going to be deciding, you know, who who, the, they, who gets proposed. But uh, some of the presidents have told me they've already gotten a slew of resumes in. Uh, I perused the ones that came to my office 
and we're talking about some seriously well-known scholars around the country. Uh, this is not going to be political. It's not intended to be political. Uh, and just because the Senate has advising consent doesn't make it political. That was what has been set up in the Constitution. And it's our duty to make sure that we have qualified people uh, that, that are going to be in the best interest uh, of the institution. Uh, and so again, the, the president of the university um, will we'll make recommendations and uh, do all the interviewing and hiring. Uh, they will send those names of the advisory board to the Senate through my committee, and we will review them appropriately, just like we review trustees uh, and, and make, our, make our determinations at that time. And then though the advisory council, once in place, will then select the director. And that also has advising consent from the Senate. But again, they'll be interviewed people will be selected from the advisory uh, council. Members of the Ohio Conference of the American Association of University Professors are critical of the leadership appointment process and of the role of the center director. They're also concerned that no faculty member would be able to weigh in on curriculum or could block the hiring of other faculty. They say that could lead to problems with accreditation. Why is that in there, that no faculty member can block the hiring of other faculty? Well, first of all, we, we've examined the accreditation issue and there is there is no issue. That's a, a red herring. Uh, secondly, you know, look, um, uh, perhaps these people have missed the, the word independent as we used it in setting these centers up here. OK, um, part of the part of the issue that we that has has caused us to want to have these institutes is because the the faculties at many of our institutions have not self-corrected themselves, okay? Uh, and have not uh, looked at the problem, identified it, agreed that there is a problem and taken steps. So why on earth would we want to have the people who we believe have been contributory to creating the environment that is not appropriate, we think, uh, why would we have them involved in selecting the people for, for this inst these institutes? I just think it makes perfect sense. It's not, it's not to disenfranchise them in any way. It's that we want to be true to the independent nature of these institutes. You talk about independent nature of the institutes, freedom, free speech, and everything. The budget language says the centers will, quote, educate students by means of free, open, and rigorous intellectual inquiry to seek the truth. How do you determine what the limits are of free speech, intellectual freedom, intellectual diversity, when you're in a university setting where facts need to be taught? Well, facts should definitely be taught, and particularly in the hard sciences. I mean, that's 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 a that's a pretty uh, clear understanding. But look, uh, I'll, again, I'll reference back to Senate Bill eighty three when we talked uh, when you and I spoke last was uh, about controversial issues, right? And and I'll use the example of uh, a climate policy. Okay, so Senate Bill eighty three has been modified to include uh, we replaced climate change with climate policy. Okay. Uh, and, and that was just a, an appropriate correction that I made in the first amendment to the bill. So let's look, let's talk about climate policy. Whether no matter where you are on the spectrum of climate change, um, there are clearly different views of policies that need to be enacted uh, in order to address whatever level of climate change problem you think there is. Okay, and and it's those policies that should be uh, carefully debated and evaluated. Uh, there is no one cookie cutter approach, you know, um, uh, to climate policy. I, I, I haven't heard a climate policy suggestion that I think has been properly vetted intellectually. Uh, people seem to be just, you know, jumping on board to whatever the, the most recent, you know, sort of soup du jour is on, on problem solving for the climate. Uh, and, and in an environment like the Institute, I think there needs to be good discussion and debate over policy initiatives, what are the real impacts of policy? What are some of the unintended consequences, like you know, alternative energy killing off a whole species of whales uh, that we're seeing on the on the East Coast? Um, it's things like that, and that's that's a kind of a small example, but you know, there needs to be debate and there needs to be evaluation of what the facts are. I don't believe that climate policies right now that, that are being proposed should be treated as settled science. Climate change is settled science. Well, climate change is, the, the, there is debate. There are climatologists who debate 
the level of change or the causes of the change or the impacts of the change. Remember the tremendously vast use of computer modeling that is used to determine and, and project what the climate changes actually are. Those should be questioned. Computer models, as you know, are models based upon input that human beings put into it. And models can be wrong. The models that, the, uh, that they developed in the UK on COVID, on COVID death projections were way off, way off. Uh, and and it, again, it's only as good as the data. So the fact that there is some climate change, we always have climate change. I think that is settled, but the degree of it and the cause of it and the proper solutions, those are things that should still be debated. You mentioned Bill, Senate Bill 83, and I, that kind of dovetails into what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, there are some changes that you've talked about that are coming to Senate Bill 83. And this, of course, is a, a big education changes bill that would, for instance, ban faculties from striking, um, remove the mandatory diversity, include equity and inclusion training for right. most situations. Um, let me ask you, what are some of the changes that you're looking at? This bill was put into the budget by the Senate. It was taken out uh, of the budget by the Senate because of concerns and passing in the House. What are some changes as this bill makes its way to the House? Yeah, uh, uh, there are probably three principal changes that are being made in the sub bill. And I'm working with the, the uh, chairman of the House committee, uh, Representative Tom Young, uh, whose committee this is in. Um, and he'll be presenting this as a sub bill. Ultimately, that's the process we have to go through. But one of the things I did was, um, you know, originally in the uh, uh, in our ver in the Senate version of the bill, we had the no strike provision applying to all unions on campus. And so what I've done is now change that, so it only applies to faculty labor. It does not apply to the service workers uh, that are on campus. You know, cafeteria workers, um, you know, uh, maintenance workers, etc. So. My concern, um, Karen, is to keep the schools open. And I don't believe that because I believe there is a contract between the student and the school when they pay for their tuition up front before the semester starts, that that's a contract. And because they're, they're public institutions, it's a contract with the state too. Uh, nothing should interrupt that. Certainly not because uh, some faculty wants to have a better dental plan or you know a longer sabbatical period. Uh, those things can be discussed and negotiated separately, uh, but I, they, they should not have the power to shut down the school. And, and that's, that's why, I, but I've made that change because I think the ancillary unions uh, really are not in a position to shut down the school. And so we've, we've made that change. We've also changed uh, and added some, some cautions or precautions, I should say, for faculty. You know, there's been a lot of uh, pushback on the faculty evaluations uh, and the tenure review process. And so what we've done is we've changed, we've added actually uh, some um, uh, um, sort of review processes uh, so that somebody, if somebody feels that they were unfairly evaluated or if their tenure was denied, uh, their tenure extension was denied, that they would have a, a process of adjudication uh, to take it up the line all the way to the board of trustees if they felt that they were being you know, unfairly uh, you know, uh, dealt with. We've also changed, uh, a, a small change to me, but I think it was relevant to a lot of people, was the student, per, the percentage of the student evaluations that would be used in the evaluation of, evaluation of the faculty member. So remember, in the bill, in 83's original form, we had six factors that were going to be used for the performance review and post-tenure review. Instruction was only one of those six. Of that one, 50% of the evaluation would be comprised of student evaluations. So some faculty members were out there saying that 50% of their evaluation was gonna be based on students. Well, that's not true. It's 50% of one sixth of the evaluation criteria. I changed that to 25% just as an accommodation. Uh, so it's 25% it's of one sixth of the components for review. I think giving students an opportunity to play some role in evaluating a, a professor uh, is appropriate. And now that we've added the uh, safeguards uh, of, of, of appeals, 
uh, that they have, if they feel that students were ganging up against a professor, that professor can appeal to the chairman, uh, the president, the provost, the president, and up to the board of trustees. I think those were very good accommodations to make, to make the faculty feel more comfortable. I want to ask you about a questionnaire that was shared with me. It came from your office. It would be addressed to newly appointed public university and community college trustees. It asks basic questions like, are you a graduate? Do you have kids at this institution? Uh, it asks for ideas on reducing the cost of higher education, increasing graduation rates. But it also asks, what is your position on the First Amendment rights of faculty, staff, and students? And how will you balance this with promoting diversity of thought on campus? And also another question, in your view, who are you ultimately responsible to serve as trustee of the institution you have been appointed to, the president, the board chairperson, or taxpayers of Ohio? Will these answers be used to screen out certain trustees? Are you concerned that some people won't want to be trustees if they have to answer these kinds of questions? Well, we haven't gotten any feed, any pushback from anybody, and we've sent out a slew of them already, and we've already received a bunch of them. And I have to tell you, I've been quite impressed with the answers, uh, not just the answers themselves, but the amount of thought that was apparently put into answering the questions. And look, the Senate has responsibility constitutionally for advising consent of these governor appointments. We've worked with the governor's office on, on, on this form. We've you know, worked in tandem with them. Uh, on this, and it really is to give us better information so that we can make judgments before we just rubber stamp uh, an appointment. Uh, and it, there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, I suppose if somebody answered uh, that, you know, they don't believe in the First Amendment, we probably have a problem with that, right? But we're, we're not going to give any answers like that. These people are already appointed and already starting to serve. Our advising consent comes after the fact. Um, but look, I, I think we, we, we'd like to know what they think about education. They strategically view higher education as important. Um, the last question you mentioned was, who are they responsible to? It's important to note because, and I've been a trustee in the past, um, you know, a lot of times trustees end up thinking that they work for the president of the university or the community college, and that's really not the case. The president works for them. And um, sometimes I think that's forgotten. And in the past, I, I've known some presidents who uh, like it that way, right? Uh, but it's the, it's the board of governance, which is the board of trustees of our, of our institutions that have ultimate responsibility for the mission and direction and performance of those institutions. And they need to be aware that they're responsible for those things. It's not just you know, uh, a, a nice thing to put on your resume these are generally very accomplished people that get that get appointed, right? Uh, but they're not necessarily experts on higher education. We're just trying to raise the awareness level for them and make sure that we have good information to base our consent on. It is not a political litmus test at, at all. Uh, we have we have a, approved appoint and consented to appointments of Democrats as well as Republicans and some many independents as well. So. Uh, they will come to my office, they'll go through our committee, and we will use those as a basis to make our, uh, to pass it out of committee and then send it to the floor for full approval by the Senate.